Ford was instituted uh, after Anthony's death about four years ago. Uh, Anthony Shadid was a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and prior to that, the Associated Press. And uh, each year we award this uh, award for journalism ethics. And I have, my name is Jack Mitchell, and I've had the pleasure of chairing the panel that does the judging of this for the last several years. And uh, I use the word pleasure because it really is, because we get to see some really incredible journalism. I mean, obviously the award winners are, and the, those that were finalists are, but even those that didn't make the finalists, there's some really good work going on in our field, even though the field itself is under a lot of pressure, but it doesn't prevent good journalists from doing truly uh, good work. Now the Shadid Ethics Award does in fact emphasize ethics, uh, and we kind of use the standards of the Profession, uh, the Society of Professional Journalists as our test. Uh, and the first of those is to seek truth. And that's, of course, what journalism is all about. And any story that doesn't do original hard work on an important story needn't bother applying. The second of criteria is minimizing harm. And this is what makes us slightly different from the Pulitzer. Uh, as you may know, today's winner uh, also is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize this year for public service. Amazing that uh, you know this uh, two panels of judges came to similar conclusions. Our criteria, though, were slightly different in that we put a little bit more emphasis on the avoiding harm aspect of it. That to have a, 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 a good journalism that also worries about what it means to those who are involved in the story. We had one entry that made the finalists that worried about the uh, social implications of a suicide story, a, story, a series about suicide, and they were concerned about will this series cause people to more be likely to commit suicide? An important question. Uh, but not important enough uh, to win our particular prize this year. The winner is really about protecting sources. Now, we all believe in protecting sources. We all tried to do that. But this organization, the Associated Press, did it on a scale and, uh, and to an extreme beyond anything that, that I've, I've seen before. Uh, the Pulitzer, uh, as they recognized, the, the same journalism and ours uh, say with a particular emphasis on protecting, protecting sources. The Associated Press, which is the winner of today, uh, rescued yes, sources who were almost certain to have been executed for talking. These were slaves working in the fishing industry. They wanted to tell their story but telling their story might very well have gotten them killed. The Associated Press rescued these people before they published the story, thus getting the story out and saving the lives. There are four AP journalists involved in this project, uh, Martha Mendoza, Margie Mason, Robin McDowell, and Esther Tutsin. Uh, two of those are here today. We have uh, Martha, and, uh, and Robin will be here to accept the award. We're also very thrilled to have today to present the award, Nada Shadid, who is the widow of uh, Anthony Shadid. Uh, we've been hoping to get here here for the last couple of years. Weather interfered last year, but this year the weather is not great, but it didn't stop the plane from getting in. And so I'd like to uh, introduce Nada now to uh, present the award. Uh, she is a journalist herself and uh, is here with uh, her son and mother-in-law. They're also in the audience today. So, Nada, would you like to uh, join us? And we will... Uh...
Hi. Uh, I am very, very honored to be here today presenting the 2016 Anthony Shadid Award for Journalism Ethics um, to a team of reporters who uncovered severe and extremely disturbing labor abuse in the fishing industry. Um, this is a very special occasion for us, uh, me, Anthony's mother-in-law, Rhonda, who's here, and our son, Malik. Uh, because this is the first time since the award has been renamed that we were able to make it. Um, when the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Center for Journalism Ethics approached me with their intention to rename the, what was previously known as the Wisconsin Commitment to Journalism Ethics Award after Anthony, I um, have to admit I didn't think much of it. I was. Um, I was at that point, um, I was a little brain dead. You know, it was right after Anthony died and uh, I, you know, I wasn't always thinking very clearly. Um, but then I thought, you know, Anthony was, uh, went to this school, he loved this school, he credits his years here with so much and he always said that, you know, being here, being part of this school, part of this community helped shape uh, the person he had become, the journalist he had become, the writer he had become, so much. Um, so it seemed very appropriate and um, and now that I look back at it, I think it was one of the best decisions I had made uh, that time. Um, it's a very appropriate award. I have looked at the finalists and read their works uh, this year and the previous years and it's just a uh, um, you know, the quality of work that J Anthony always aspired um, to do and, um, you know, the kind of journalism that he always wanted to, um, to do. Um, and I think it's just a, a, a wonderful tribute to him, to his legacy, uh, and for that I'm really grateful. Um, Anthony was my husband, but before that, he was also a colleague, and through working very closely together in Beirut and Baghdad and other places in the Middle East, it was always very evident to me that not only he applied a very high set of ethical standards in his um, journalism and reporting and writing, um, but I think his ethical, ethical conduct was always, um, I think, driven or came from his deep empathy and humility towards um, the story, the characters, the places that he was writing about and that he was covering. Um, I always think that it was more, um, it wasn't as much as, you know, he was following a set of ethical guidelines, but more that his empathy uh, was dictating the way he covered and the way he, he wrote and the way uh, he presented his work. Um, and I think that ties up a lot to what Nicole was earlier saying and a lot of the other guests and speakers that how important it is for journalists, um, th their empathy and their humility and ha how that, you know, I think drives a lot of um, uh, how ethical we can be in our work. Um, I hope that this award reminds us every year of the sacrifices that Anthony and, and other journalists like Anthony have done to bring difficult stories and challenging narratives to us. Um, and it also reminds us, and it reminds me, and I'm reminded of it every day, of the big void that he's left in my life, in you know, the journalism world, and um, the newspapers, the, the coverage in, in, in the newspapers, um, especially in issues that, um, uh, that Anthony was focused on covering uh, the Middle East and Arab American issues. Um, Finally, I'd like to congratulate um, Robin and Martha who are, who are here today and their colleagues for winning this award. Um, I very much enjoyed reading their work. It was wonderful, um, as disturbing as it was to hear about, to learn about this, but it was just a beautiful work of journalism. Congratulations.
have here some certificates and a check, small check, but a check that we're to recognize this, and the plaque, which uh, you have, which, uh, honors all four of you, plus the Associated Press itself. But I'm glad that the two of you are here. I'm yeah. sorry the other two probably aren't, aren't reporting stories, they would guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. People in this room, you have no idea what this means to me because I worked with Anthony and um, he was fantastic and um, he was an editor of mine during the Democratic National Convention when the streets of LA were erupting in violence and he, had, he was in charge of assignments and he assigned two of us to the same hotel room, myself and Chelsea, and then he told her she was going to the galas and balls and to go rent outfits and I was hitting the streets and make sure I had some boots. And um, <laughs> he took me aside later and said he knew that that's what I would have preferred and he was right. Um, he was foremost concerned about all of our safety. Um, he, when reporters amongst us did get arrested, everything else stopped to help make sure that they were okay. He was, in, in what was kind of day and night reporting, at the Associated Press, he was funny and lighthearted, and he also let me do whatever I wanted to do on top of it. If I said I want to go into the apartments of people whose, whose lives are upside down, they can't get to work, they're very poor, and they're now breathing tear gas, and their kids' beds smell like tear gas, he said, just go do it. You just whatever you want to do. And then he would fix the copy and make me look better and take zero credit for it. Um, he was a lovely, lovely person. And there's a vast community at the Associated Press who miss him dearly. And so thank you, Nada, Malik, you're being awesome being here, very impressive. And I'm so glad you could come, Rhonda, from Oklahoma. It's really special. It's, the entire Associated Press was absolutely thrilled and wanted me to pass on their, their care for, for you guys. So thank you. And, um, and I know he would have really dug this story that we did. <laughs> I know he would have been doing just that. Oh, just go for it, just keep going. Um, so we knew that there were slaves at sea because some would escape and they would tell their stories. And we reported their stories as did Bloomberg and The Guardian and many others very eloquently. They told stories of being trapped on fishing boats at sea for years, beaten, um, deaths, tortures, and um, the stories gained little to no traction. They were selling their fish out of Thailand. We knew Thailand exported to the United States, but it simply was too general. And this is something you guys have been talking about today, about having to be so specific. And you can't just generalize on, these, on this stuff. And so, um, so Robin and Margie plotted to come up with what was the holy grail, find captive slaves and um, then track their catch with detailed accuracy back to the people who are eating their fish. So I'll let Robin take it from there. Hi. Um, so it was a long, slow process. It took about a year before we finally got to Benjina. Um, I won't bore you with, <laughs> with, with, the, with the monotony of kind of going through uh, you know, scrolling the internet, talking to sources who didn't know anything, all those things. Um, because the power of Benjina really was what, what got us. Um, the moment we arrived, we knew that this was a big fishing company and that it was really ground zero for our reporting. Um, these were fishermen who had been pushed, uh, the islands in, in Indonesia, um, most of the reporting to date had been done in Thailand, in waters off the shores of Thailand. But the worst abuses we, we learned were happening farther and farther from shore, away from the eyes of the, of the world. So that's what took us to kind of faraway waters. This had been a, what looked like a legitimate fishing company that had been operating for, for over a decade. Um, and if you just went there, as many Indonesian officials did, they didn't know it was what was happening. They didn't know that all the men, most of the men were Burmese, that they'd been tricked, they'd been, they'd been, in some cases, outright kidnapped or sold onto boats, and that they had been stuck there for years. 
when my Burmese colleague um, Esther Tucson came, the doors swung open. Those men had not seen they they had not seen a journalist, especially someone from their own country, and they started pouring out their stories. They couldn't wait to tell us. You know, even with their abusers right around the corner, they would tell us about the beatings. They would tell us about the threats. They would tell us about people being marched up hills and handcuffed and, and beaten um, for trying to run away or being locked in a little hut on top of the hill. Um, and mostly they wanted to tell us that they hadn't seen their families sometimes for decades, in one case two decades, um, five years, ten years, and they were sure that their families thought they were dead. There was no way to get any message out to those families. So they would come running down paths for the few days that we were there, just jamming pieces of paper in our hands, saying, this is my mother's address. Please tell her we're alive. Um, one, one young man gave us the only picture he had of his mother and said, please find her. Just show her this picture, and she'll know I'm alive. Um, they'd come to our house at night, and they would, you know, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, still be knocking at the door, you know, more people saying, please take us with you, please get us off. So it was really, it was um, really one of the most, most desperate situations I had seen as a journalist 20 years, 20 years in Southeast Asia, pretty much. Um, and nobody was afraid to tell their story. Nobody said, we don't want to be on camera. Nobody said, don't use our names. Um, basically, the feeling was that they had died already. They just wanted their families to know that they hadn't abandoned them. So when we left, um, we were stuck as a team with the problem of having the most powerful story we could, ima we could have imagined when we set out to do it um, with tremendously brave men. And we had to make the decision for them, are we going to use their names and faces and risk putting them in danger? And it could have meant definitely beatings, possibly death. Or do we, do we take away their names and use the video that we had kind of in, you know, silhouetted images? Or, or we, we took two sets, basically, one in case we wanted to use their faces and names and one in case we didn't. Did we take away the power of the story that they had so bravely spoken out to tell um, and, and weaken it? So in the end, the, the third decision, the third option was try to get them try to get them off the island, get the eight men who we were quoting off the island and who we were videotaping off the island, and it included, included one man, the most powerful figure, a man who was in jail and interviewed inside the, you know, through the bars of a cage, basically. Um, so our colleague Margie Mason had very good contacts with the International Organization for Migration. They worked with, and she showed them the footage, and he agreed, we need to get these guys off. The story needs to have these names and faces. He worked with the Indonesian Marine Police, and they went and they, you know, took pictures, photographs of the men, their names, and went and, and got them off the island without telling the fishing company the purpose. So once that happened, we were able to publish and, and use everything. Um, and I think, I think we all really see that as our proudest moment in that story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and do you want to talk a little bit about the... You can, or do you want to just do a Q&A? Do you want to do a Q&A? Well, we want to spend some time on a Q&A. Sure, let's do that. Uh, so if each, maybe if each side member would just like to work in. Well, I was wondering on the how you first came upon this. What, how did you even know of this situation uh, before you started investigating it? Was it the, on the consumer side, the fact that where does this fish come from, or just how, how did the story come to be? There, there'd been some strong reporting by um, escaped slaves about escaped slaves um, that we had read and, and that we had done as well, and so. It was, it, as people would come to shore, they would sometimes run from their boat, and then they'd end up with a relief agency. And so NGOs and others had told their stories, as had some media. Yes, I 
Um, yes, we have. I mean, after, after the stories were published, I'll add that, that more than 2,000 men also were freed. Um, and we're in touch with, with some of those eight. Um, the man in the cage is trying to now start a hair cutting <laughs> business in his tiny village. Um, some of them, I mean, I, I think one thing that is important to remember with all the men who got off the island is that they're returning to desperately poor situation back in Myanmar. It's very hard to find jobs um, and they're vulnerable again to being trafficked. Some of them are going back to Thailand and trying to find jobs in, in factories and other things. So some are, are you know, one, one of the men said he would never leave his mother again no matter what, no matter if, if their whole family starved to death and the mother agreed, you know, yes, he wasn't going anywhere. So it, it just depended on, on the circumstance. Um, but we're, we're in touch with many of them and one of them uh, was very instrumental in our shrimp, in our investigation into shrimp, um, shrimp peeling shreds and the use of, of children and, and other, others enslaved in that industry. So that actually became an ethical issue for us. We actually semi-hired one of the rescued slaves back to help us work um, because Thailand at that point had said it's not our problem and we said, yes, it is. We're gonna, let, you know, can, can you come find some people who are enslaved here, help us find some enslaved people here? Over here. Well, we were kind of doing two things at once. So we had, a, we had tracked their seafood by Robin had documented the boat that the um, fish went onto, and that boat had a satellite tracker on it. And so we were able to watch on a map that boat going to shore, and we had meticulously followed it being unloaded into factories. And from those factories, we had used customs bills of lading to go to US importers. And from there, we tracked it to brands. So then we have a deadline, right? And we've got to get these guys freed and we want to confront the companies and give them plenty of time to give a meaningful response, not just like gotcha or, you know, worse yet, ha publish Walmart and slave in the same sentence without giving Walmart an opportunity to respond. Um, but the timing was really intense because we didn't want to bring it to the companies and then have them start taking action too swiftly to, to counteract our story so we were, we were hustling at both ends, get these guys out, and I believe it, I'm gonna say it took about two weeks. It, it was surprisingly fast. Yeah. We, we thought this could take months, yeah. and we're gonna have to make a call at some point to use their, maybe not use their names and faces, but it, it, the weather worked in our favor. Um, often that island is completely inaccessible because of the, the high waves, um, and the, the just determination by the ILM um, we got really, really lucky. But yes, every second we thought we're not going to pull this off. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think journalism like yours elevates our whole profession. But I would imagine that you probably had some conversations about advocacy journalism and can you share what those conversations were like? Well, uh, uh, there were plenty. And at one point, um, we learned that many of these boats on the slave island of Benjina had fled with slaves aboard. And Robin was in Myanmar, and I'm in Silicon Valley, and she's like, you have to find those boats, Martha. <laughs> and so I'm calling the Pentagon and NASA and anyone else who might be able to take a high-resolution photo from space. We had an idea some had escaped through Papua New Guinea. And a company in Denver shot a 500-square-mile photo of water. And when we zeroed in, we found boats that looked just like ours. We sent the digital images to Myanmar, and men who had escaped from those boats confirmed that those were the same boats. So now the question is, do we alert the authorities? Because right now we've got a latitude and longitude, and that photo was taken within the last few hours. Or do we hustle and publish a story, getting everybody an opportunity to respond, and by then the boats may be gone? And so we put down the notebooks, and I mean, we weighed, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? We'll miss the story, or the men won't get help, and so we put down the notebooks and um, called the authorities who moved in 
and um, seized the shipments and freed more men on those boats. And we did get the story also, but, but we, yeah, we had those discussions. And what we decided is that um, it's, it's okay to advocate against human trafficking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, although, I should say, when I was invited to testify to Congress, AP said no. That puts you in a position of advising on policy, so no. And worse yet, when I was invited to the Vatican, <laughs> the editors, the standards editors at AP thought that also would put us in a position of advocating on policy. But, but bottom line, when we went to our editors and said this might be happening, I mean, their answer was, if you think there's slaves there, well, you have a moral imperative to go, go look. Um, it was a little, a little fuzzy. Um, when we got to the island, I went with an Indonesian photographer and an Indonesian videographer. And we presented ourselves, we, well, we presented them as journalists with the AP, and I kind of was just, didn't explain exactly who I was. <laughs> so they were given initially um, an official tour to kind of show off this rich maritime history and industry and they were brought to the factory grounds and actually got the first glimp of the glimpse of the men in the cages and got photo you know photographed that and I was off um, going to coastal other coastal villages finding men who had escaped years earlier and interviewing them and you know saying I was kind of more of a tag along wanting to go to the market wanting to go to the school and teach English a little bit and um, so so that was a little bit that, but in terms of speaking to the men, they all knew the 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 village, the village officials and the factory officials did not know I was a journalist. Um, but when Esther, our Burmese colleague, came, every single one of the men that we spoke to knew we were journalists. They were they were very happy to have journalists there. Um, so that that part was very clear. And I did full disclosure before I went to Seafood Expo, which I thought would be an easy way to bring this to the attention of the dozens of companies we had identified in the supply chains of slavery. So I told the organizers what I was doing and who I was, and they put out a blog with my photo to every single person at the convention saying Martha Mendoza, Pulitzer Prize winner, is writing about labor abuse in the seafood sector and you don't need to talk to her. And so <laughs> all that meant was that the videographer and photographer first were separate from me so that they could get their cutaways and their seafood samples and then when I joined them, you know, people just didn't talk to us much. Hi. Um, so a lot of what was talked about today on other panels was building trust in the community that you're reporting on and you mentioned that you had a Burmese friend who's a journalist and who made that initial connection. So could this story have been told without that connection? And what did you do to build trust with your sources, especially considering the high stakes for them, and as well as the fact that this was a place you had never been to before at all? Um, we could have done the story. I mean, we had pretty much what we needed before Esther got that in terms mm -hmm. of some interviews, but those interviews were old. They hadn't been on boats for about two years but men in cages, a graveyard where, where dozens of men had been buried, Burmese men had been buried um, under fake names um, by some of their friends. So we had, we had something, it, but really it was in a way just scratching the surface. We wanted those, those voices, actual current slaves, to, to elevate it. So, and, and Esther Tucson came, I mean, she's, she's a co-winner with us. She, had almost, she's only, she's a new reporter just a few years into journalism and, you know, was possibly operating a little more like a translator to begin with, but her questions were always taking things further for us. Mm -hmm. And so we made her very much an equal partner. And she also, um, when we returned to Myanmar, went together, we went and found those families and she stayed in touch with the families um, throughout the course of the investigation and then went with the families to the airport when they came back. So it was really, you know, they continue to be very close, uh, especially to Esther. I think there's going to be a lot of little 
Esther's born in the next year. <laughs> <Me and Mark. laughs> she, she considers a lot of the men who like brothers, and they consider her like a little sister. Yes, Aside from uh, getting the slaves freed, uh, what are what are some of the other impacts of your of your story, and are you satisfied or disappointed with the the subsequent reactions of government agencies? Well, well yeah, I'm surprisingly for those of you who know me, I'm I'm a little unusually pleased with what's happening in the federal government on this one. Um, soon after the story. Um, after the story, the State Department responded that the U.S. has a law that bans imports of slave-produced goods. And so I looked up the law and called Homeland Security and said, there's a law that bans imports of slave-produced goods? And they said, sure, the Tariff Act of 1935. It's been around 85 years. And so then I said, well, how often is this being enforced? And they said, well, it's been enforced, you know, 30 times in 85 years. And I said, well, why is that? And it took many calls to many prosecutors who finally pointed me to two words in the law that said consumptive demand. And it's a loophole that said that if there's a consumptive demand, then you actually can import slave-produced goods. The reason is because this was the 1935 Tariff Act, the U.S. was rebuilding, all rubber imports were slave-produced goods at that point in the United States, and they felt that they couldn't rebuild without rubber. Um, but in 2015, so I wrote an article of just really underscoring this, um, there was a Republican, Chris Smith from New Jersey, who held a congressional hearing. Both parties easily agreed on this, and um, Obama signed a law in February closing that loophole, and in March, so far, Customs and Border Protection has stopped at least two loads of slave-produced goods at ports. These are the kind of the low-hanging low fruit for them, which is Chinese prison camp produced goods, which um, everybody knows. But that's, that is significant. Um, eight people in um, Thailand have been sentenced to, uh, no, Indonesia. More than a dozen people yeah. have been sentenced in both countries. Yeah, more than a dozen people have been sentenced. We're feeling like the sentences of three years for human trafficking might be a little light, but they've gone to jail. Millions of dollars worth of seafood has been seized. Large car refrigerated cargo reefer boat continues to be held by the Indonesian authorities. Um, we're watching very closely to see what the State Department does next month or in June when it ranks Thailand for human trafficking. They've blacklisted them for two years in a row at tier three. Um, that's a tough political move by the U.S. government because Thailand is a very important ally, a politi close political ally, and by blacklisting them on um, trafficking in persons reports, it sends kind of a mixed message. But. Um, I think there's a lot of genuine concern. And, at, at and the, definitely yeah. there's a lot of bad stuff still going okay. on. I think, I think we, the intention for us was to show that the entire industry is dirty and it, it starts from the top, but really some of the biggest problems are the police, agents, people who are, people who are kidnapping and getting these guys on the boats, the, the seafood owners. So, so there, there's still thousands of guys on, the, on boats trapped for sure on other islands, probably all over the world, and not just Thailand, you know, Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean. Um, it's, it's, it, we're very happy with the impact our story had, but it just is a scratch in the industry as a whole, I think. Yeah, and on the, on the corporate end, companies like Walmart and Whole Foods and Red Lobster have done little to nothing um, in response. You indicate, I should, of all people, remember this. Um, is it on? Um, you indicated in the, uh, in the entry level that it, it's, you said something like, even we were surprised that the decision uh, to do the rescue first and then publish uh, was unanimous when you talked with the people in New York. I wonder if you could describe that discussion a little bit and, and even tell us why you were surprised. So we um, talked twice a day. <laughs> for more than a year and continue to most days with, and because they're Margie and Esther and at the time Robin were on the other side of the world, these conversations would take place at bedtime or wake up for either or both of us. 
and we would talk amongst ourselves and now and then when the conversation escalated to the point where we felt like editors would be quite upset if they knew that we were <laughs> making decisions then we would bring them in. This was a conversation where we had kind of come to the end of our rope of what should we do and, if, and so um, the editors were on the phone as well and we explained that we had kind of narrowed this down to can we blur their faces? That's like, you just cannot do that at AP ever, ever. It's a firing offense, immediate firing. So we couldn't blur the faces of these guys in the cage. Um, should we use those silhouette shots they had? I don't, the ones we had of them, I mean, their eyes, the desperation is just so obvious. You see a person in a cage, you gotta do something about it. Um, and so then we said, you know, and the third choice is get them free. And the editors were rather just swift and said, well, yeah, that sounds like the best plan. You think so? Yeah, that sounds like the best plan. Okay, we're going to get off the conference call. You three figure out how to do that. And they got off and we all, you know, we just were breathing. Like I could just hear them breathing across in Asia. So, so you guys, um, what do we know about freeing slaves? <laughs> and... Um, we knew some people at NGOs who do this work, but Margie felt pretty confident that her source at the International Organization for Migration would understand it. it was a little complicated. We want you to take these eight people out now, and in doing so, then we can publish this story, and in doing so, then we may be able to have a much broader impact. So it was, a, it was she felt he could understand that, and he definitely did. Well, John Smalley, uh, who is one of our judges, uh, had a question that I'll, I guess I'll ask it for him. Uh, which means more to you, uh, the Pulitzer Prize or the Shadid Award? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, only one of them made me cry when I heard about it, and that's thinking about Anthony. Um, so. You know, a Pulitzer Prize is one of those things they say goes on your obituary, but when you work with somebody who's so special and they're lost to journalism and to their family, then that's, that's pretty powerful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Martha can tell you, how many times did I say this was the one that, that meant the most to me? Yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's, it's very meaningful. Uh, being an, uh, fighting for ethics like this at a, is, is in a company the size of ours is a discussion and a challenge, and um, it's definitely what Anthony would have been all about. So. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you.